Hey, Suzanne, thank you so much. And everybody from Zoomedica for having me back to talk a little bit about uh, big problems from a small gland. And I also found out when I had a little chihuahua like you see up there in your upper left-hand corner, you can get big problems from small dogs as well. I love my little dog, Chuck. He was a chihuahua, but he had his host of medical problems that always uh, was one thing after another for the poor little dude. All right, guys, well, welcome this morning. Uh, let's go ahead and get my slide set rolling here. Yeah, as Susan said, uh, I wear a number of different hats. As you can see, the one I have there, I, I still think I look good in. Uh, currently, right now, I just uh, earlier this year was in Cuba and uh, I was trying to mimic earning, uh, Ernest Hemingway. And uh, I grew a beard for that. I haven't got rid of it. So today I've got the uh, Santa Claus look for the holidays for you. Ho, ho, ho to everybody. I am uh, not at the North Pole. In fact, I'm almost at the equator coming to you from the Florida Keys today. So what we're here to talk about today is a little bit about adrenal gland uh, function and testing. Uh, you know, when you think back of the adrenal gland tests that we're going to review and then talk about some new aspects, you know, this has been going on for a long time. Most of our adrenal gland tests that we still currently run today were developed in the 1970s. Uh, so again, we've got some newer advances for you and hopefully some things that can possibly change the way uh, you practice uh, at least adrenal medicine and, and possibly other endocrine issues. So let's start by looking real quickly at the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Today's talk is a little bit heavy in physiology and pathophysiology, and I, I apologize for that in advance, but it's important as a medicine clinician. And I promise you there will be a good takeaway at the end as to why we go through these things. So again, if you remember the normal hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access in a dog, the hypothalamus in the brain secretes corticotrophin releasing hormone or CRH. We really won't uh, talk much about that today because CRH really doesn't do much for us from a diagnostic standpoint. But CRH stimulates your anterior pituitary gland to produce ACTH adrenocortical uh, releasing hormone. And that ACTH is a positive influence then on the adrenal glands within the abdomen. And if you remember, of course, the adrenal glands have different zones. The zona fasciculata, which is part of the cortex of the adrenal gland, is thus stimulated by ACTH to, to produce cortisol, which then through the bloodstream diffuses to the rest of the body to do all the wonderful things uh, that cortisol does. Um, if you remember, like most endocrine systems, there's a negative feedback where the amount of cortisol in the body will feed back to that hypothalamus and, and anterior pituitary gland. So we can turn on or turn off this system based on the body's need. If we need more cortisol, we'll turn on and we'll increase ACTH production. If we have enough cortisol or too much cortisol, we will then, of course, shut down that system through negative feedback. So a very tightly regulated endocrine system, like you see with other things, especially thyroid gland would be another good example. Also remember, just for a point of clarification, the adrenal gland has other zones. And the important one for today will be that zona reticulosa, which is also something that's in the cortex region, the outer shell, and it produces aldosterone, which we'll talk about a little bit later today. Okay, so... When you go back in my career, at least over the last 35 plus years now, um, in medicine, we emphasize to our residents and to ourselves as internists, I think, through most of the 1980s and 90s about this disease, Cushing's disease, and it really caught fire. I mean, it was really something that I think became uh, a point of emphasis and, and very aware to us in the medicine world and thus uh, to private practitioners in clinical practice. In fact, in 2012, uh, we authored a paper at ACVIM uh, talking specifically about diagnosing Cushing's disease because it was being tested for that often. Again, uh, what is Cushing's excessive cortisol production? Uh, how many dogs really do get it? Lifetime prevalence is probably only 0.3%. So it's something that I think, you know, we certainly see with, with some frequency, but at the same time, it's, it's not something that, uh, you know, we see every day. And I think sometimes we are overly suspicious of patients having it since the clinical signs of Cushing's can cross over to many other disorders. Affects all breeds, uh, no specific breed really uh, beyond anybody else. The mean age is somewhere just under 10 years of age. Females are slightly overrepresented. 
And you see the traditional looking Cushionoid dog here in this picture with that tremendous truncal hair loss, that pot belly, that muscle wasting. And again, because of the emphasis that we've placed on this disease over the past decades, everybody is certainly aware of that dog. But we see a lot of other dogs that may or may not have Cushing's disease, like you see in this little overweight Chihuahua here, what a little tub this guy is. Uh, but from the bottom line is, is that uh, clinicians are very suspicious based on physical findings, clinical signs, and laboratory findings as to whether patients do or don't have Cushing's. And as such, uh, a lot of adrenal function testing is performed. Now that's in contrast, of course, to underactivity of the adrenal gland or hypoadrenocorticism, uh, Addison's disease, if you will. And again, uh, this has gotten a lot of attention, again, really in the last 10 years, uh, lots of journal articles. We haven't put out a consensus statement to date on this, but again, it gets a lot of press. Uh, again, simply it's the opposite of Cushing's, a deficiency of adrenal glucocorticoids and, and most of the time mineralocorticoids, that aldosterone we mentioned. It's a little bit less common in dogs and Cushing's, uh, but still, you know, roughly uh, just slightly under that 0.3% uh, prevalence. Uh, but again, we have a lot of early suspicion. A lot of clinicians think about Addison's, which is wonderful compared to an early in my career when it didn't get much attention and we missed diagnoses. Now we tend to test quite a bit for this possibility of this disease. And there you see some of the photo children, the uh, standard poodles in, in that picture there. So let's talk a little bit about that adrenal function testing and, and how we might screen individual patients that we as a clinician have a suspicion either have adrenal overactivity, Cushing's disease, or adrenal insufficiency, Addison's disease. Um, traditional screening tests have really all focused on either stimulating or suppressing adrenal cortisol production. Um, and they really have not looked a lot at the role of endogenous ACTH as that negative feedback hormone or that hormone, again, that's produced when we need to make uh, cortisol. Uh, so all of our focus has been really based on, on looking and evaluating how can we look at what cortisol is doing in that zone of fasciculata. All right, so let's start with Cushing's disease, go through some of the traditional testing that we've done since the 70s, as I mentioned, and maybe where we could consider making some improvements in this screening test and where it might be applicable even in your own practice. So Cushing's, as we all know from a basis of review, hyperadrenocorticism can come from two different areas. It can either come from the pituitary gland or directly from the adrenal. So looking at the pituitary gland in the brain first, um, many people will refer to this as pituitary dependent hyperadrenocorticism uh, or PDH. Uh, it can happen usually from a tumor. Uh, it's either a generally a benign tumor. In rare instances, it's malignant, but it can either be a very small tumor, a microadenoma, which is probably 80% of the cases. And this other 15 or 20% can be a macroadenoma where you can actually physically on CT scan see that pituitary lump coming out of that saddle, the cella area of the, of the uh, pituitary gland. I think a better term that we like to think about maybe is ACTH dependent, uh, because again, these sort of tumors are producing ACTH. So that's what they're going to create Cushing's disease. Cushing's in pituitary cases is ACTH dependent. That's in contrast, well, I guess before I do that, for the rest of my presentation, I'm gonna introduce two little emojis to you. This is my little devil emoji, and that little devil emoji is going to represent pituitary dependent hyperadrenocorticism, because it's not that bad. I mean, that little purple guy, we can control him in most of our cases. And then we're going to contrast that to adrenal dependent disease, uh, where we get either an adenoma or adenocarcinoma that develops within the adrenal gland cortex. And in those cases, it directly produces cortisol. So we could call that ACTH independent. It has no bearing. ACTH doesn't really influence. That's a tumor that directly produces cortisol independent of whatever ACTH is doing. And for today, we're gonna to use a little bit of a frowny, nasty, red-faced emoji as our adrenal tumor, because that one can be a little bit more delicate and difficult as you guys know to treat. Okay, 
So let's talk about hyperadrenocorticism testing then. First point that I can't overemphasize this enough to you guys, you should only test patients that you really suspect have the disease. Uh, otherwise, uh, the negative predictive value of testing just any random patient is going to give you a lot of false negative results uh, and false positive results. So again, we want to enhance statistically our chance of getting it right. So we should test patients that have consistencies with the disease. And that's true with any endocrine disorder. So in Cushing's disease, it's again, you guys know, polyphagia, polyuria, polydipsia, panting, the three Ps, generally weight gain, abdominal distension, especially because of that hepatomegaly and that muscle weakness that goes into the abdominal muscles. Uh, we oftentimes see endocrine skin changes, that truncal alopecia, uh, and oftentimes uh, we can get maintenance of hair, especially in the facial areas. Laboratory changes are fairly consistent. Elevated liver enzymes, especially alkaline phosphatase. Hyperlipidemia, uh, again, high cholesterols and triglycerides. Leukograms oftentimes have changes in white blood cells reflecting stress, cortisol. And of course, we can see that cortisol can stimulate red blood cell production and platelets. So sometimes our red blood cell and platelet indices are slightly elevated. So again, we see these sort of signs. And again, we should see these major signs in most Cushionoid patients that would prompt us to say, I think this patient might have Cushing's. So what do you want to know as a clinician? You want to know, is the patient Cushionoid or not? And if they are Cushionoid, is it ACTH dependent pituitary gland or is it ACTH independent coming and emanating from the adrenal gland. That would certainly be the desires to find out whether we got that little purple guy, ACTH dependent, or whether we have our red face tumor of the adrenal gland, ACTH independent. Now, how do you do this testing? Well, let's go back again and look over time what most of us have done. First thing we don't wanna do is random serum cortisol, just a basal cortisol level, you might suspect that most Cushing's doid dogs will have a high basal cortisol, but it's really not a very good screening test. There is a considerable overlap between healthy patients and hyperadrenocorticism patients. There are wide fluctuations throughout the day, especially in healthy patients that at times will push them above the standard reference ranges you see here. And we know that stress dogs that don't have Cushing's or ill dogs that have other illnesses, comorbidities, and don't have Cushing's will oftentimes have higher basal levels. And even Cushionoid dogs at times will fluctuate in their values, and they can fall either if they have a tumor of the pituitary or the adrenal. They can fall within the reference range at times when we take samples. So again, first lesson today, random cortisol testing for the diagnosis of Cushing's disease, not a good idea. So that brought us in the 1970s to say, hey, why don't we try to stimulate this zona fasciculata where the adrenal gland produces cortisol? You know, we know that it certainly is going to be abnormal in a cushionoid patient. And if we stimulate it, it's likely to produce excess cortisol. So that brings us to the ACTH stimulation test where we can give a synthetic ACTH. Cocitropin would be the drug that most of us would purchase a five microgram per kilogram dose intravenously, and that should be a satisfactory dose to go ahead and stimulate that zona fasciculata. Now, we'll take a basal steroid level at zero hours, give the ACTH, and take a one-hour sample if we're doing it intravenously. Occasionally, we will use uh, intramuscular gel, which would be then a two-hour collection sample. In a normal patient, the zona fasciculata should stimulate to a degree, but not excessively, and should fall somewhere in most laboratories less than 20 micrograms per deciliter, or if you're using international units, less than 560 nanomoles per liter. Now, what happens if you're a cushionoid patient? If I put that pituitary-dependent uh, adenoma in your brain, that's going to produce more ACTH. Remember, ACTH-dependent. That's going to create a thicker, more cell stimulation in the zone of fasciculata. And after we give ACTH, we should then see cortisols that exceed 20 micrograms per deciliter. So we stimulate above that normal range. And even the patients that have tumors of the adrenal gland, ACTH will directly stimulate cortisol release from them and any normal 
adrenal tissue they have, bringing us again above or overstimulating our normal values. Is it a good test? It's not bad. It's, it's got reasonable sensitivity and specificity. When you look at uh, studies over the years, uh, we probably find there are more false negatives, so lesser in sensitivity for this test. So if you have a patient you think probably has Cushing's disease and uh, you want to prove that that's what they have, you feel pretty strongly about it, this is a good test because the specificity, fewer false positives, is likely to truly tell you that that case has Cushing's. One of the problems with it, it does not distinguish, though, between pituitary dependent or adrenal. Uh, it also is costly. If you've purchased any cortisol lately, it's a very expensive hormone. Uh, it's not always available. And for many of us, we simply don't want to stock in our hospitals because the bottle goes bad on the shelf before we use the entire bottle up. I won't go through this today, but there are protocols to uh, dilute that bottle, draw it into aliquots, freeze it, and that way at least you can get more mileage out of an individual bottle and save some money on cost. The other problem with this is that uh, you do have to send two cortisol levels to a laboratory. And again, cortisol levels are certainly not, not inexpensive. Okay, so that's the ACTH stimulation that we've used now for what, 60, almost, well, 50 years now. <clears throat> Low dose dexamethasone suppression would be an alternative test trying to suppress the zona fasciculata, which is suppress cortisol uh, uh, released from that area. How do we do it? We give an intravenous dose of dexamethasone, 0.01 milligrams per kilogram. Now that's going to feed into that negative inhibition arm of the uh, pituitary axis. And thus that's going to shut down ACTH production because the body feels like I don't need any more cortisol. And over the next eight hours, because we've shut that system down, we should be able to see in a normal patient a decline in their serum cortisol. In fact, it should drop at the eight-hour post less than 1.5 micrograms per DL or 30 nanomoles per liter, depending on which, uh, which uh, values your laboratory uses. Now, we'll also go ahead and, uh, again, have a basal sample, and I'll talk about a four-hour sample here in a second. Now, in a patient with Cushing's disease, if I put that uh, macroadenoma or microadenoma in the brain, again, pituitary dependent or a, a ACTH dependent, that cortisol, dexamethasone, is unable to suppress that tumor. Thus, we're going to go ahead and we're going to continue to make cortisol. So our value in the bloodstream at eight hours would be greater than those values, 1.5 or 30. So we get a lack of suppression. We can't slow down. And uh, Dr. Byron recently, Julie, give a shout out to her, uh, talked about the honey badger and said the honey badger don't care. Well, the pituitary tumor don't care. It's not going to be suppressed by dexamethasone. And in fact, an adrenal tumor generally is going to, again, not be suppressible. So our cortisol levels will be above those standard reference ranges. So what we're looking for for this test to prove you have Cushing's or not is we're looking at an eight hour sample. If you have a, again, suppressed sample, no Cushing's. If you have a lack of suppression at eight hours, you have Cushing's disease. How good a test is this? Better, 95% sensitivity. So very few false negatives with this test. Specificity is a little bit more of a challenge here. We have a lot more false positives. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with normal patients will still oftentimes test positive, as will patients that are stressed from coming to the hospital, uh, the patients that have non-adrenal illnesses. Uh, so again, no test is perfect, but this test oftentimes is a better test. If you have a patient, you say, you know, I'm not sure they have Cushing's. I think I want to rule it out. This would be a better test to run because if you do get a negative or normal result, it's much more likely that that patient doesn't have Cushing's disease. Now, the value of this test, other than the ACTH, is it may also be able to discriminate between pituitary and adrenal uh, disease. That's still an expensive test. You have three cortisols to submit when you do that. It's cost of dexamethasone, as you all know, is extremely negligible, but you still have to take the time, eight hours, and submit three samples during that time period. Uh, how does that test work? Just to review real quickly, if you do have pituitary versus adrenal, Patients with pituitary or ACTH dependent Cushing's will at least show some suppression when you give them dexamethasone. 
At eight hours, they will have escaped suppression or not achieved it. But in the intermediate time, four hours, they oftentimes can show us some degree of suppression. So we either look for one of three patterns. At four hours, if the cortisol suppresses less than 30 nanomoles per liter or less than 1.5 micrograms per deciliter, and then escapes back up, again, the eight hours says we have Cushing's, that patient has pituitary dependent disease most likely. Uh, another pattern we might see is called partial suppression, where the four hour cortisol has at least dropped by 50%, but never goes into the normal range. So the patient has Cushing's at eight hours, but again, has dropped by at least 50% at four hours, partial suppression, most likely pituitary dependent. The eight hour sample uh, can also be helpful for us where if you see a patient that again, suppresses more than 50% from baseline to eight hours, even though they're above the normal range, that's Cushing's, they would be most likely affected by pituitary dependent. So again, an interesting test that certainly gives us some valuable information. Um, but again, we have to jump through all these steps in interpretation. I'm not gonna talk much about the high dose dexamethasone test because quite honestly, it, it just doesn't work well. Um, it's giving a 10 times higher dose of dexamethasone, thinking that if you do that, you'll be able to successfully suppress all pituitary tumors, and they would then fall down at eight hours below 1.5. You have to repeat this eight-hour test. Um, and if you had an adrenal tumor, you would not be able to suppress it at eight hours. It would be greater than 1.5. Uh, again, the adrenal tumor would be considered stronger and less likely to suppress in the face of dexamethasone. But bottom line is, guys, this test is horrible. It's got very bad sensitivity and specificity. Up to 50% of pituitary-dependent tumors do not suppress. So really, the test is unreliable, and I would not use it as a way to differentiate between pituitary and adrenal gland disease. So how do you differentiate? Well, if you have a patient that has Cushing, so you've proven it on either that ACTH stem in the appropriate clinical sign patient or that low dose DEX lack of suppression, you can go ahead and prove what they have, either pituitary or adrenal. You can certainly rely maybe on that information on the low dose DEX to help discriminate, or you can do imaging. Uh, imaging, ultrasound of the adrenal gland. Uh, very effective if you're good at ultrasound. Uh, the adrenal glands are there. They're looking at you. And over time, you'll develop the ability to find them and see them. A patient with pituitary-dependent Cushing's disease, again, has a lot of ACTH, ACTH-dependent, and will equally stimulate that zona fasciculata in both glands. So they should look symmetrical, as you see left and right here, and probably a little bit bigger than normal. Normal uh, width is what we look at, or thickness is usually in most dogs uh, five to seven millimeters. And most Cushing's dogs will be greater than seven millimeters, one millimeter, maybe one and a half millimeter in larger dogs. So we're looking for symmetry and slightly thickened adrenal glands if they have pituitary dependent. Obviously, if you have an adrenal tumor, you're gonna get a misshapen abnormal gland and the other gland probably atrophies and becomes harder to identify because you're not using it. This bad boy is, or bad girl is making all of the cortisol, suppressing the rest of the system. And uh, you can see here it's growing out of the cranial pole of that, uh, of that adrenal gland. So again, if you're good at ultrasound, it's something you can certainly pick up on. It can be very valuable in determining what type of Cushing's your patient has. If we're really advancing into medicine now, you could consider using CT scans microadenomas stay within the cella. They're very tiny. You don't see really any significant change or enlargement in the pituitary of that patient with Cushing's. In contrast, patients with macroadenomas get this bigger protrusion of the tumor and it grows outside that normal saddle area. You can actually see that pituitary macroadenoma here. The disadvantage of, of imaging and relying on it is simply its operator experience. You've got to have the machinery. You've got to be trained on it. You've got to be good at it. And it takes time. There's a learning curve in any of these sort of uh, types of images. Um, also, have to have availability. Maybe you're not going to do it, but you're going to send it to some other specialist to do. And in that instance, sometimes nowadays, my goodness, it can be two to six weeks to get in to have imaging done with somebody that's doing that.
So that can be a little bit of a delay in your case as well. And certainly it's a big cost. There's no doubt about it that imaging adds significant cost to differentiating what these patients have. So, hey, that's all cool. Uh, let's take a summary slide real quick then of what we've learned so far. Don't use serum cortisol by itself. ACTH stims, not a bad test. Pretty good if we think the patient might have Cushing's, but it's a lot of money to spend in Corcoran, not always available. Low-dose dex, a lot of money to spend in three cortisols. Pretty good test. Again, if you're trying to rule the disease out, maybe even a little bit better. Uh, if you're trying to differentiate Cushing's, uh, it may give you that information. So not bad. And if we're discriminating, again, please, no high-dose dexamethasone suppressions. Ultrasound CT, SAMs, beautiful, wonderful to do for differentiating what type of Cushing's you have. But again, you got to get it done, either yourself, learn about it, or you got to send it out, and it is significantly expensive. So kind of begs a question. We did all these things now since the 1970s. Is there a better way we could do all of this? What if we could look at both sides of the equation? Cortisol, which we know will be elevated here in dogs that have Cushing's disease, right? Either your Corcoran, uh, post-Corcoran is either elevated above 20 or your eight-hour DEX didn't suppress. It's above 1.5. But what if we looked at the same time at a basal plasma endogenous ACTH level? What if we looked at the negative feedback portion of this and the production portion of this arm that could give us maybe valuable information that could say to us where is the disease coming from is it dependent on the brain or is it independent in the adrenal gland so if we did measure an ACTH and it was elevated at great, greater than 80 picograms per ml that would be very suggestive that that little purple devil that ACTH dependent micro or macro adenoma is in the pituitary gland so I've not only diagnosed Cushing's, I've also diagnosed where it's coming from with, you know, a, a pretty simple sample to run. And if I ran that sample, that ACTH, and it was low, less than 10 picograms per milliliter, shouldn't be low. Um, that tells me I have ACTH independent Cushing's disease. I must likely either have a tumor or someone slipping this dog a lot of steroids iatrogenically that I didn't know about. So this ACTH level can be very informative in a sim simple single blood sample done at the time of your cortisol testing to tell you whether or not this is going on. So anybody that lives in a university system like I do oftentimes can do this because we have the machinery that will deliver that kind of result. If you live in the real world in private practice, endogenous ACTH levels have been hard to do. The hormone degradates very quickly, it's very labile. And 50% of this hormone is probably lost in two to four hours if you don't refrigerate or freeze it. And about 100% hormone loss within 24 hours if you simply go ahead and set it on the shelf, if it thawed on the way to the lab, if there was any kind of problem. So it's very difficult sometimes to transport that hormone to a laboratory to be assayed. Um, but what if? Here's the key. What if you could do it in your practice? That would be nice, wouldn't it? So we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. But before we come back to that, let's swing over and take a look at our other arms here, our Addison's patients. So again, here's a couple of the poster children. I already mentioned the standard poodles. My favorite breed, Nova Scotia Ductile and Retrievers. I had a beautiful one named Kaylee for 14 years. She was a wonderful dog. It's a really special breed if you haven't been introduced to these guys. They are knuckleheads. They love to toll, chase things all day long. Now, there's a big push anymore in breeding everything with poodles, right? So we get all these doodles and things. So if you wanted to increase the Addison's prevalence in your own practice, then you want to get a standard poodle breeder and a duck tolling breeder, breed these together. And these would be called what? Uh, duck doodles, I guess. And there's a duck doodle right there, actually. Yeah, duck doodles. I, I don't know if they'll end up having a higher prevalence of Addison's, but it certainly would worry me. All right, so briefly, let's talk about Addison's disease and then back to some of our interesting tests. So Addison's disease can be defined as either primary hypoadrenocorticism where the adrenal gland is destroyed, either by immune-mediated inflammation, maybe lymphoma, a vascular infarct of both glands, all of these things can happen. And if we wipe out just the zona fasciculata where cortisol is produced, we're going to get a glucocorticoid deficiency People might call that atypical Addison's disease, right? And if we wiped out 
both the fasciculata and zona reticulosa, where mineralocorticoids like aldosterone are produced, we're going to lose both cortisol and our ability to produce aldosterone. So we're going to get sodium, potassium, electrolyte imbalances. And again, that would be considered typical primary hypoadrenocorticism. So you can catch an Addison's patients anywhere in that development where you might catch them early, where they've only destroyed the fasciculata. And in that case, they will have normal electrolytes, or you may catch them at a more advanced degree of disease, more destruction into the zona reticulosa, and they will be the typical Addison's patients with hyponatremia and hyperkalemia. Now, you can also get secondary hyper, uh, hypoadrenocorticism. It's not that common. This would be something that would only create a low ACTH, either from some congenital defect or damage to the hypothalamus or pituitary gland, so you couldn't produce the end product, ACTH. Uh, that doesn't happen very often. Uh, in fact, when we see secondary hypoadrenocorticism, a lot of times it's due to us as clinicians giving a drug like prednisone or any glucocorticoid, uh, whether it be orally, topically, ophthalmically, that can then suppress through negative feedback that normal system so that we, the body says, I don't need any more steroid. So it shuts down ACTH. And if that steroid's abruptly taken away, that patient suddenly becomes deficient, the machinery can't crank up quick enough, and they can be secondary hypoadrenocorticism. Now, because this is only an ACTH deficiency, all of these patients would look atypical. They would have normal electrolytes because they have normal aldosterone levels. Okay, how do we test for hypoadrenocorticism? Well, again, we always test patients that have typical suggestive signs. So either they're acutely ill, severely ill, they can be shocky, they can have severe vomiting, diarrhea, bloody stool, significant weakness, and associated with abnormal electrolytes, that typical hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, or um, they can be sort of a nonspecific GI disorder where they just aren't right. They just have a little bit off. The appetite's not good. They've lost weight over time. And many of those cases will have normal electrolytes. So bottom line becomes, again, patients that are typical have much more severe problems because of that aldosterone loss. Patients that are atypical and only lose glucocorticoids, many times it's a much slower progression. It's a disease that oftentimes is not as significant clinically. But if you have a chronic case, it certainly is on our radar screen. Okay. So what do you want to know when you have a patient with suggestive signs? You, you want to know, is the patient Addisonian? So we need to prove it, whether they have the deficiency in cortisol. And if so, if they were atypical, what's the likelihood that that's going to transition to typical over time? Is there any way we could predict that? Or do we have to constantly be on our toes looking for that transition. So we have to keep pulling these patients in and rechecking their electrolytes or aldosterone levels every few months. You know, is there a better way we could do that? Okay, so let's look at screening for Addison's disease. So we mentioned before that a basal cortisol is not a good idea for Cushing's. What about for Addison's? You can certainly consider running a basal cortisol, but when you look at it, whether you've destroyed your adrenal or your pituitary, uh, you know, a basal cortisol would be low. Less than two would be the cutoff micrograms per DL. And uh, if you didn't have Addison's disease, you would think it would be normal, above two. Well, what do we know from testing? We know this, that patients that have Addison's disease are basically always going to be less than two micrograms per deciliter of their cortisol levels. However, there's a substantial number of non-adrenal illness patients that can have the same symptoms and signs that if you look at their cortisol will also be below two, but they don't have the disease. And this is even more of a problem in the cases that have normal electrolytes. So you really can never rule in Addison's disease based on a low cortisol, but look at your Cush or I'm sorry, look at your Addison's patients. None of them, the true ones, have a cortisol above two. So a cortisol above two can rule the disease out, rules out Addison's disease. So a very good specific test, but not a very sensitive test. So again, if you want to look at it first to do it, um, again, if it's normal, rules the disease out. If it's abnormal, you still need to pursue whether the patient truly has Addison's or not. Because again, some patients with similar signs will have a low cortisol level. 
So the ACTH stimulation test, just like we mentioned before, is the gold standard test. You can use anywhere between one to five micrograms per kilogram in this test. You can use a lower dose to stimulate the adrenal. If the patient does not stimulate, if their resting cortisol, zero hour and one hour, are less than two, in most cases even non-detectable, uh, that would be the confirmatory test as we've always done it for Addison's disease. Uh, expensive test, again, has all the same limitations. You've got a bicortricin, have it available to you. If you have a sick patient and you need to get the drug, it takes time. It may delay the diagnosis. And another problem is it doesn't do anything to differentiate whether your problem is um, primary or secondary if the patient turns out to have normal electrolytes and is an atypical cushionoid patient. All right. So that brings us back to our question. Here is uh, our standard poodle uh, crying out to you. I think I may have Addison's disease. I'm a skinny poodle that occasionally doesn't eat and gets diarrhea, has some thin muscle mass. Do I have Addison's or not? Is there a better way we could test? And could we use that ACTH level like we talked about in Cushing's to help us? Well, let's take a look and see if we determine both hormones simultaneously, could it be useful? If we look at steroid cortisol only, we've already had this argument that if you are looking at a value of less than two, it's gonna pick up some patients that are even sometimes healthy or have non-adrenal disease. So by itself, cortisol less than two doesn't make the diagnosis. If we look at ACTH levels, again, if you have Addison's, negative feedback, the pituitary gland should say, hey, look at this. I need to make a lot of ACTH to make cortisol. It just doesn't know that downstream that the adrenal glands can't do it. So your ACTH level should be very high with primary hypoadrenocorticism. But when you look at tests, unfortunately, there's a bit of an overlap. 30 uh, is usually the, the value that we use for a normal ACTH. You would think it would be substantially higher than that in an Addisonian. And many of the times they are up here in this box and scatter plot. But again, some healthy patients and some non-adrenal patients will cross over with Addison. So by itself, unfortunately, at first look, you'd say this isn't helpful to me. But there's this thing in the world called statisticians. Statisticians are smart people. They can go ahead and look at other ways to look at data through different angles and lenses. And sure enough, there's two papers published here in the last five or six years now, looking at this and saying, hey, if we ran a cortisol to endogenous ACTH ratio, there is discrimination. All of a sudden, we can see the separation occur. In fact, anybody who is an Addisonian patient, primary Addisonian patient, should have a lower cortisol, a higher ACTH from that negative, again, lack of negative feedback. And uh, they should have a ratio that would be below, in most cases, 0.03. Because again, the, the ACTH at the denominator is bringing that ratio down. Um, so they went ahead and said, hey, this is a test and looked in these papers and beautifully even set the limit a little bit lower. It maximizes specificity so that you don't get many in the way of false positives. Uh, and But sensitivity is awesome. So the value is 0 0.1. A cortisol to ACTH ratio less than 0 0.1 is consistent with primary hypoadrenocorticism. Again, doesn't tell us anything about typical or atypical. That's what electrolytes tell us. But it does tell us this patient has a lack of cortisol production from the adrenal gland. Uh, so a really cool test. Now, we know it's not secondary because a secondary patient doesn't make ACTH. So in that case, the ratio would be worthless to us. So this is a really nice test if you could run ACTH levels. And again, just showing you here. If you went ahead and ran it and your ACTH level was in fact low, that would suggest at least that you have secondary hypoadrenocorticism. It's a pretty rare diagnosis, but if nothing else was wrong with that patient, and they had nonspecific signs, GI oriented, normal electrolytes, if you ran an aldosterone level, it was normal, then this lower ACTH in combination with lower cortisol, that combination is highly, highly suggestive then of secondary hypoadrenocorticism, and you would simply treat that patient with low dose uh, daily hydrocortisone or prednisone. Okay, so how can you guys do this? Well, it'd be nice if you guys could. 
Uh, first thing is get a university job, move to a university, become a faculty member. And then you have this big machine called the Emulite 2000 that can run ACTH levels for you. I probably didn't convince too many of you that's a good idea. But you could do point of care cortisol testing. We know that there's multiple machines that run those in your hospital. But there's now a new machine that can do endogenous ACTHs at the point of care at your clinic as well. And that is a machine that's called the Truforma, made by our sponsor today, Zometica. It's a really cool machine. Uh, it's small. It's a shoebox size. It plays music. It can actually make your day better. When you turn it on, it plays good tunes. But it does tremendously good platform for measuring and assaying certain hormones. And as time will progress, I'm sure other tests as well. It's a cool technology called bulk acoustic wave technology, which I'll briefly describe to you in a second. But most traditional, uh, like the Siemens Emulite 2000s, they use either optical or some fluorescence detection system to tell you how many molecules are in a sample so that you can decide what uh, your level of either ACTH or cortisol or thyroid, whatever hormone would be. Bulk acoustic wave technology does not use light scattering or fluorescence. It actually uses uh, a resonating waveform. Where do you find those? You find them right here in your cell phones. You find them on airplanes. You find them in all kinds of different manufacturing things nowadays. Technology has gotten a lot better than the 1970s when we started looking at these tests through optical or fluorescence. And this resonating frequency changes are not only really cool and accurate and precise, but they're also way less expensive than some of the previous methodologies. So is it any good would be the first question you ask. Well, some studies have been done and pilot studies have shown us and confirmed that compared to the Emulite 2000, the gold standard test of chemilucent competitive immunoassay, the Truforma assay you can do in your hospital for cortisols has a high correlation and value with no apparent bias, as does the ACTH level. So pretty cool stuff. How does the technology work if you were to put this in your hospital? Well, it's pretty simple. You have a sensor, again, a resonating plate that when you put a signal to it, it resonates at a certain frequency, a very high frequency, a matter of fact. And you'll impregnate it with antibodies that can capture molecules of interest. So in this sample, let's say ACTH in green is our molecule of interest. We would go ahead and turn the machine on. The resonating plate would start to resonate at a very high frequency. We would put our plasma sample in. And as that fluid passes through the sensor area of a cartridge, it's going to those antibodies would go ahead and bind ACTH or cortisol or whatever the analyte of interest is. Now, as you can imagine, if you're binding something, you're weighing down the plate. And if you're weighing something down that's resonating, it's going to cause a frequency shift. And you're going to start to frequency, uh, your, your wavelength will be at a different frequency, a slower frequency, because it's heavier. That signal is then put out. And it can be through mathematical models, then determined exactly how much of this hormone you have in your sample. So it's a really cool, and again, you know, I want to say state-of-the-art, almost aerospace technology type uh, way for us to now look at molecules within blood samples. Again, small bench top, and it's not only useful for cortisol and ACTHs, but you could use it for now total T4s, free T4, TSH levels in dogs and cats. Uh, so it's something that's got a, a wide endocrine platform already. And again, other tests will emanate out of this in the near future. Um, again, it's a very nice machine. It's a very user-friendly machine. The technicians love it. It's just a cartridge plugs in, and you put your sample, either blood or plasma, or serum into that, and uh, it'll then go ahead, it takes about 15 minutes in most cases to give you a result. So you can actually do it in-house, immediate results, and talk to your clients about treatment uh, if uh, it's warranted that day. All right, so to summarize and follow up on you guys, how you would use it. So if you have a Cushing's patient, in summary, this is the new option you have as far as testing. You can still go back and do you know, your older test, or you could consider doing this and maybe replacing some of the steps in diagnosing and discriminating a Cushing's patient. Patient has clinical signs. You draw a baseline plasma ACTH level and you refrigerate it. We're going to come back to that sample in a few hours 
if the patient has Cushing's. We're going to go ahead and do our traditional ACTH stimulation or low dose deck suppression. There's still some people nowadays are calling for not even having to do all the samples. You might only do the two hour cortisol. You might only do the eight hour cortisol. If those are abnormal, again, if they're uh, elevated for the ACTH or lack suppression for the low dose decks, that confirms your patient has Cushing's disease. Now I wanna know, is it ACTH dependent in the brain, pituitary, or is it in the adrenal, ACTH independent? I go to the refrigerator, I get my ACTH sample out, and I run that plasma sample through a separate cartridge, and that will discriminate my type. If it's elevated, that patient has ACTH dependent or pituitary disease. And more than likely, if there's no neurologic signs or problems, we're just gonna start that patient on treatment today. If that patient has a low ACTH level, we're going to consider that independent. It's not coming from the pituitary, must be coming from the adrenal, might be a bigger issue, might not, but we probably then are going to consider if for the appropriate patient, maybe sending them for ultrasound, further imaging, staging, so we can decide whether they are a medical or a surgical patient. So you can do it with uh, two blood samples and basically do it that same day in your hospital and get all this information without ever having to look at all these other discriminating tests or imaging studies. Pretty cool stuff. And then for Addison's disease, again, you get a patient who's got suggestive symptoms or clinical signs of Addison's, you go ahead and draw a blood sample. We want to draw both serum and plasma simultaneously, and we're going to run them. We're going to run first the serum sample, and if that sample is less than two micrograms per DL, highly suggestive of Addison's, still might not be. So we're going to then go ahead and put our plasma sample into the ACTH cartridge. And if that comes back as abnormally elevated, it's going to tell us that suggests Addison's disease. And now we're going to go ahead then and make that calculation of the cortisol to ACTH ratio. And if it's less than 0.1, that tells us, confirms Addison's and discriminates the type. It tells us it's primary disease. If we were to find that the ACTH level was low, then in fact, it makes it much more likely the patient is secondary hypoadrenal. If a patient is secondarily hypoadrenal and they're atypical, have normal electrolytes, likelihood is they'll never need a mineralocorticoid supplement because their problem is in the brain, not making enough ACTH. They can make aldosterone. If they are a primary dog, if that ACTH, I'm sorry, if that CAR ratio, cortisol to ACTH is abnormal, uh, less than 0.01, then if they are atypical, you at least know they're primary and you have to be very suspicious that over time, likely their aldosterone production may decline. And that's the patient to watch more closely for development of typical electrolyte abnormal Addison's disease. So guys, that's our talk for today. It's kind of less, hey, let's rethink some things. This is the you know decade of the 2020s. We're not still in 1970s and 80s, like when this old gray haired man and bearded dude got his veterinary license. Uh, recognize some of the limitations of these traditional endocrine tests. Uh, again, don't always look at the end product. Let's start thinking about the negative feedback and some of the stimulation and negative effects that occur in endocrine systems. Maybe we can take some of the cost out of things for owners by making things more streamlined. Um, it's really cool technology. So with that, I wanna thank Zometica again for having me on today.